Hi, I'm Paul Morin with the Energy Conservatory, and welcome to our webinar titled Using a Pressure Pan to Diagnose Duct Leakage. And we'll go over some housekeeping items first. If you're having trouble with the audio, click on the meeting uh, menu, pull down menu, and choose the audio setup wizard. And that will step you through a number of steps to get your audio uh, set up and optimized. If you're using the Adobe Connect app on a mobile device, uh, you may need to plug in headphones or speakers uh, in order to hear the audio. Um, please type in questions as you think of them uh, in that box at the right, and we'll be answering uh, those questions as we go along, and then we'll also do a, a question and answer session at the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website soon after um, after today. And um, we also have dozens of uh, recorded past webinars that you can view at any time. Um, please give us feedback on, on how you think this webinar was and, um, and let us know what types of webinars, what topics you'd like to see in the future. This webinar is available for uh, one continuing education unit and we'll upload that information to BPI and, uh, and that'll appear on their BPI site uh, as credits um, after a little bit. And um, we don't offer a completion certificate, so um, just check that BPI site in a, in a couple of months and uh, your credits should be up there. Um, if, you, if you didn't provide us with your BPI number when you registered, um, you can send us an email at editor at energyconservatory.com uh, along with your full name and BPI number, and we'll make sure that you get those BPI credits. Um, in order to receive those credits, the continuing education unit credits for BPI, um, you will need to be logged into the webinar using the same email address you registered under. And um, so if, if, if there's a couple of people watching the webinar on one computer, uh, only the one who, um, who logged in will get the credit. So um, make sure that, uh, that you make arrangements to, to get your credits. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, uh, we, we recommend that you contact uh, Adobe Technical Support um, and, and their phone number is 1-800-422-3623 um, and select the option for in-meeting support and you'll get connected to, to an agent right away. We've had, we've had good luck with Adobe Connect on our um, technical support for, for difficulties in the past. Um, some examples could be losing audio or video or being kicked out of the webinar. Um, and any issues using the mobile app. Um, if you need to call uh, Adobe Connect for, for tech support, uh, please send us an email. We're looking for input on how that technical support went and, um, and uh, explain to us what, what happened so we're, we're aware of any issues. Uh, we want to keep up with, with, um, with these and provide the best webinars that we can. So the agenda today is um, we'll first start out with just the basic intro to the pressure pan and, and then get into how, how the pressure pan works, uh, typical field procedure on how to use the pressure pan, examples, we'll show a couple examples of, of some uh, field results and um, and then we'll, we'll spend quite a bit of time on, on tips and interpreting the readings because that it does get a little tricky. Um, and we'll talk about some, um, some methods that, that have been used for using pressure pans to screen houses for, for duct repair potential. And, and there are also certainly special considerations for, for ducts and garages because of indoor air quality issues. 
So the pressure pan it, it has been primarily used for for duct retrofits. For um, um, there are some incentives through through various programs for for increasing efficiency and saving energy by retrofitting ducts in existing homes. And, uh, and that's primarily how the pressure pan is being used is in a retrofit application, but you certainly could use them if you're doing code compliance testing on new homes and the, um, the ductwork fails, you can use the, pre the pressure pan is a great way to diagnose um, where the leaks are because the highest pressure pan numbers are going to relate to um, the ducts that are that are leakiest to the outside, and and that's a an important differentiation with with the pressure pans is um, it's not for diagnosing total duct leakage, it's it's for diagnosing the leakage to the outside. Um, before before you start duct sealing, or even um, when you're trying to determine if if doing duct sealing at all is going to be cost effective, um, that that is oftentimes when when the pressure pan will be used at, at at that point before before the sealing starts when you're trying to determine is it going to be cost effective to seal these ducts. And you know, as always, getting the, the correct info is, is the key to quality control. So it is important to understand um, some of the building science behind pressure pans to, uh, to assure that you're getting the correct info and that it's being interpreted correctly. Um, one of the big advantages of the pressure pan is you're able to get that, that data quickly. It's um, once you have the blower door set up, you've got you're going to have the blower door set up to do a blower door test anyhow, and um, and getting that additional data quickly is really um, the key to, to being cost effective. And certainly, pressure pans can can greatly speed up the cost effectiveness. So not only to help determine if it's worth. Um, spending the money to seal uh, those ducts, spending the time uh, required to seal the ducts, but, but also um, speeding up the diagnostics part. Um, if you misinterpret the data, it, it can lead to the wrong decision. So it it's really becomes very important to make sure that you understand what the readings mean in this house with the uh, with how you have it set up and um, with pressures in adjoining spaces that contain ductwork. Um, most um, duct sealing programs where they're, where they're offering incentives and rebates do require an air leakage test. So you'd still need to do a, a duct blaster test, but, uh, and, and the pressure pan is, is primarily um, used in, in, in most cases to diagnose where the leaks are um, and, and it doesn't take the place of duct blaster tests although there are there are some programs that we'll talk about that um, that that have used um, pressure pan readings alone and, and not a air leakage test so the the pressure pan is basically just a gasketed pan with a pressure tap um, um, pretty pretty simple. Um, it comes in two sizes, a 12 by 14 and a 22 by 22, and it's got a gasketed edge to fit tightly uh, against the um, ceiling or wall where the duct is. Um, it includes a, a patch of Velcro on the pan and, um, and a handle that has Velcro on it that sticks to that and 15 feet of tubing. Um, those of you who have, have uh, older pressure pans had that section, suction cup and, and the extending uh, handle, and we do have retrofit ones. If you want to switch over to this type, um, we, uh, um, we do sell these as a retrofit um, also. And that handle does have a, um, a tap on, 
an end on it that will allow you to, to screw in a painter's pole or a broom handle or something if you've got taller ceilings and, uh, and need a, a longer extension. Um, we don't sell those, but those are readily available uh, and you can get them in various lengths, in various uh, adjustable lengths. Um, an important thing to understand is that pressure pans do not measure leakage. If, um, and, and what we're going to be talking about today is primarily using it to diagnose duct leakage, although it is often used to measure, um, to do, do zone pressure diagnostics and um, a better application, recessed lights are, 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 are a typical thing that, that they're used for to try to determine a pass fail if those need to be leaked. Um, um, used or not, and, and a pressure pan is not the right device for that. Um, you could use an exhaust fan flow meter, for example, but the minimum reading you could get um, for that is is 10 CFM, um, but and that's using the the smallest opening on that exhaust fan flow meter. If you're interested in, in measuring flow for a, for a pass fail criteria. Um, you could do something like that. When, when pressure pans are used for, for pressure diagnostics, you know, a good application of them would be on a, um, for example, on a, on a kitchen wall where there's a drop ceiling, I mean a uh, uh, drop soffit above the cabinets, and you want to see if that drop soffit is open into the attic. Um, you could put the pressure pan uh, over an outlet and take a measurement in place of taking off the, uh, the outlet plate and, and putting a probe alongside the electrical box. Um, you know, when you're doing that, you're getting the pressure in that stud cavity, um, which gives you an indication if that, um, that soffit is open in the attic or not. So you know the, the pressure in the attic and, and uh, if, if you measure the pressure in the stud and it's the same as the pressure in the attic, you know there's a connection or you know, it's likely, very likely that there's a connection there. And, and you'll essentially get the same reading by, by putting the pressure pan over that opening and taking the measurement that way as you would, um, or you'll get a very similar number as you would sticking the probe directly in that wall. So that's what you're doing. So on a recess, recess light, you know, what you're essentially doing is, um, is measuring the pressure in the attic or something close to it. Um, recessed lights get, get even trickier because if that light has been on in the last few hours, you're gonna have a much different temperature in there and temperature definitely affects pressure. So that, that, will, um, that will affect your reading also. So it, it becomes difficult to use a pressure pan in that application. If you are using it to measure airflow through an exhaust fan flow meter, um, you'll need to, to um, uh, pressurize the house because remember the, the air needs to be going through the hole in the exhaust fan flow meter for, for you to get an accurate reading. So you'd have to, you have to pressurize the house in that application. Um, so the pressure pan, when we're using it to diagnose duct leakage, it's used with the uh, blower door running. Um, and it's used to measure the degree a particular duct run is connected to the outside. So when you're, you know, you're, um, um, you're, you're, uh, uh, you got the house at 50 and you're going around from, uh, from duct to duct, um, you're, uh, register to register, you, you're measuring the degree which that particular duct run is, is connected to the outside, uh, when you're taking that test. So it gives you a quick, um, identification of where the major leakage sites is. The higher the number, the, um, the more leaky it is to the outside. And, and it can be used as a quality control tool to, to um, track the progress and confirm the effectiveness of your work. So if, you know, in, in some cases, you'll have one that that's really, has a really high number and, and that will affect um, all of your other numbers also. And you can seal one or two or three ducts and, and get all of the numbers um, down. So um, tracking your progress 
starting the blower door up again and tracking your progress as you're sealing um, can, can really um, um, speed up um, speed up your work and and confirm that that you're getting good num that you're that you're making uh, progress and and when all the numbers are low enough then you can do a duct blaster test and and confirm that you've got the amount of reduction you're hoping for so how the pressure pan works um, bring the house to 50 put the pressure pan over the opening if if you're getting um, zero uh, pascals with that duct, you, you know that that duct run is, is very tight. Um, so you, you know, tight ducts if you've got a low number. Um, if you're getting a really high number, uh, you know, it's likely if you get something, your, your house is at 50 and you're reading a 46, it's likely disconnected and reading the pressure in the attic uh, rather than the pressure in the duct system. So um, really high numbers are, are an indication of a, a um, of a disconnect or a partial disconnect. So the uh, procedure when you're doing a, um, a duct leakage test, uh, you'll, you'll want to uh, turn off the air handler and, uh, and always remember to remove the filters. You'll want to temporarily, temporarily seal any intentional openings like an air inlet that's connected to the duct system. Um, any, you, you're trying to measure the, the unintentional duct leaks in the system, so you'll want to seal off any intentional leaks like a, like a um, fresh air intake going to the outdoors connected to a return duct. You'll want to open unconditioned spaces containing ducts to the outside as much as possible, and, and this is also the case when you're doing uh, duct blaster tests. If you've got a, a vented crawl space, you want to make sure the vents are open. Or if there's a door in that um, in that crawl space, you want to open the door. Uh, it, the goal is to see to, to find those leaks and uh, and, and know um, the extent of those leaks. And in order to do that, you want to um, you want to have uh, the full pressure across all of those leaks so you um, um, so you really get an idea of how how uh, um, how much each of those uh, are leaking bring the blower door to 50 measure the it's important to measure the pressure between unconditioned spaces um, containing ducts and the house so measure that pressure measure the pressure in the attic with respect to the house um, to see if that's at 50 pascals. And, and the same with uh, pressures to um, crawl spaces or, or any, you know, you might have multiple attics that, that aren't interconnected with each other. And uh, you want to measure all of those pressures containing ducts to, to see what that pressure is. Because that, you, you can't interpret the readings unless you know what that pressure is. If the pressure is less than 45, it's going to be very difficult to interpret the numbers. Um, it, it really, um, uh, you know, I can't stress that enough that that's, that's an important part of interpreting your numbers and comparing numbers you use on one house compared to numbers you would use on another house. You want to connect the tube between the pressure pan and the gauge and then place the pressure pan over the register and record the readings. Um, uh, when I was doing this, I would typically um, start with the first uh, register to the right of the uh, uh, front door and then work my way clockwise around that level of the house and then go upstairs and, and, uh, and do the same. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll need to come up with a procedure on on how you're taking these numbers, how you're recording these numbers, and um, especially if somebody's going to uh, follow behind you and, and do quality control using the pressure pan, uh, you want to be able to uh, come up with a process that works. And it, it may be sketching a floor plan and marking where the registers are and writing the numbers that way, too. If you run across a uh, register a grill that's larger 
than the pressure pan. So you're using the smaller 12 by 14 pressure pan and you're measuring a central return grill. Um, there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can temporarily seal that whole register and poke a tube through the seal. Um, that would be one way. Uh, another way would be to uh, seal off a section, the section of it that's larger than the pressure pan, and then, and then use your pressure pan on it. That would be another method. Um, and you do want to make sure and temporarily remove that seal before going on and, and taking your next reading. That's important because that will affect your other readings. Um, sometimes you'll have two uh, registers um, that are closely connected on the same duct run. And, uh, you know, it might be um, uh, one in um, going to, uh, to a room and then another one was tapped into that in the basement. You can see that um, occasionally in, in northern climates that uh, we have houses with basements. Um, some other older houses will have one uh, running run going to the upstairs and, uh, and it might have a register in, in two uh, bedrooms on an adjoining wall. So both bedrooms are, are being heated by one, um, by one register, one uh, run going up. Um, so, so as you can imagine, if you put a pressure pan over one of those, it, it's going to be open, way more open to the inside and uh, that, that's providing a pressure relief and you're not really me measuring the register or the um, you're not you're not measuring the pressure in that duct run so you'll need to seal off one side either side and, and only measure one side and you don't have to repeat that by sealing off the other side you, you'll get the same reading no matter which one you seal off so you'll need to seal off one side and then take that measurement and, and remember to unseal it uh, before you go on to the next register. And only one person at a time should be taking readings because uh, your readings will be affected if, if you have two people doing it because um, the, the, the readings you're taking, kind of the, the building science behind it, is your readings are, are reflecting the ratio of how leaky it is to the inside versus leaky it missed to the outside. And if you have two registers covered at the, the same time, you're, you're decreasing the leakiness to the inside and it'll affect your readings. So we'll go over a, a couple of examples and um, what this bar chart is showing is the areas in white are what the initial pressure pan readings were and and in black is what they were after they were sealed so you can see we've got one labeled R1 so that was the return side and then we have eight supply registers here and this was a tri-level house um, had an upflow furnace in the garage had a single return and supplies in both the crawl space and the attic. So what they sealed was um, they sealed the return, which had a really high pressure. Um, it, 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 that had a pressure at 17. So they sealed that return and an air handler filter slot and then floor, the floor boot connection at registers one, three, and four. And, and once that was done, they, they um, did the pressure pan readings again and got them all down. Um, you know, the highest ones are 1.1 and one. So uh, two of them, one or higher, and all the rest were, were very low. Um, one interesting thing you'll, you'll notice is that the supply register six um, wasn't was one of the higher ones, but it wasn't one of the ones sealed. And um, the, the reason for that is is six wasn't um, wasn't very close to the air handler. It was farther away from the air handler, um, and would see less um, less pressure in the system under normal operating conditions. Under normal operating conditions, the the leaks closest to the air handler have the most effect, have the biggest dramatic effect and uh, biggest effect on, on energy use. Because remember, 
the, uh, the amount of air that will flow through a hole is based not only on the size of the hole, but the pressure at that location. So, um, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more on prioritizing, um, prioritizing leakage. But, um, but the, you know, with even without doing any sealing on register six here, it went from two point three down to to one point one because the um, the leakiness of the system to the outside decreased and that, that drops those numbers across the system. So the duct leakage before on this one was, uh, was 425 CFM and after was less than 25. So they uh, made huge reductions in um, reducing the duct leakage and, uh, and they stopped before, um, before doing all of them because it it got less cost effective after after doing just those few locations. So the next one um, is a single story with an upflow furnace on a platform return in the garage. It had a single return and it had supplies and returns in the attic. They sealed the platform return and they sealed all the flex duct connections uh, to the trunk lines and they sealed the boots. So this is um, um, pretty typical. Usually the flex duct itself doesn't leak very much, but, but the connection, um, the, you know, the metal connection between the takeoff and the, uh, uh, and the trunk line, um, needs to be sealed and then the the connection between the boot and the and the ceiling um, sealed too and, and in doing that they they dropped all the pressures uh, to one or less on this one the duct leakage before was was about 250 and they and after um, they dropped it down less than uh, 85 cfm So next we'll go over um, some tips on in interpreting those readings. Um, and, and part of this is, is uh, prioritizing which, which ducts you're gonna go after first and which ones you're gonna seal. And you know, like we've been stressing throughout, higher numbers means the, um, means the larger leak to the outside is close by. So, if, uh, if you get a high reading on that, um, on that duct run or on that return system, that's, uh, um, you're close to, you're closest to the, to the highest number means you're closest to the biggest leaks in the system. And as you mentioned before, proximity to the air handler is important because under normal operating conditions, the, um, closer you are to the air handler, the higher the pressures. Um, supplies are a higher energy priority. So um, we're interested, I, I mean, this is the goal. We wanna, we wanna reduce energy use, not just reduce our number. So we, you know, we have to keep our priorities straight here. Um, it's great to get good numbers, but, but the important thing is making sure that, um, that we're reducing the energy bills. And, and supplies um, have almost twice the, the energy penalty that returns do. But returns typically will have a higher uh, indoor air quality priority because if you've got return leaks in, in a place where there's pollutants like a garage or a, or a, um, a moldy crawl space, um, that's gonna have a higher indoor air quality priority. And there certainly are some attics that, that have mold issues too. Um, we see it in cold climates a lot where, we, where you have condensation in, in cold weather conditions that uh, causes mold, mold problems in, um, in attics. And, and that could certainly be an uh, uh, indoor air quality issue also. The, um, um, you know, dirt and, and uh, mold that that you can get in attic spaces. Um, you want to consider the temperatures of the unconditioned space. A, um, an attic is certainly going to be at a, a much higher temperature difference 
than a crawl space. So for energy saving reasons, um, attic would certainly have a higher priority than a crawl space. Um, air, indoor air quality is a different issue, but, but for energy savings alone, um, the attic will have a much higher priority. And you know this is a, a very important um, building science principle uh, um, that the duct leaks to the inside will dilute your pressure pan reading. So if you've got if most of your ductwork is in the house inside the house and you just have a few runs in the attic um, and there's a lot of, of duct leaks to the inside, um, those are gonna gonna dilute your pressure pan readings a lot and, and you're not going to uh, get as much information from those readings. And, and pressures in unconditioned spaces matter. If you've got a well-vented attic with, with ductwork running through it and your house is at 50 um, pascals and you measure the pressure to the attic and it's close to 50 pascals, um, that's going to be a lot different than if you measure the pressure to the attic and the, the um, pressure is only at 20 or 25. So um, in, in interpreting these numbers, um, pressure, the pressure in the unconditioned space with reference to the house matters. Um, so you wanna be comparing your readings with the max possible reading. So we're getting house at 50, we're measuring, um, you know, in this case we're showing, putting a tube up alongside a duct, you have to pull the register off um, and, and measure um, between the sheetrock and, and the duct, get a measurement up into the attic or, or do it at, a, at a, uh, a hatch, an attic hatch, measure that pressure in the attic so we can put all our numbers into perspective. So if we're at 25 and, uh, and we, get, we get a reading of 5 pascals, um, that's a lot different than if we got a reading of 5 pascals with, with the house to attic pressure at 50. So um, if those numbers were linear, then we could, we could say, well, it'd be about 10 pascals, but those, those pressures aren't exactly linear and it, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to, to interpret those readings. Um, we're gonna uh, cover some, some issues that were, um, were covered in, a, in an article in Home Energy Magazine. Uh, it was titled Pressure Pans, uh, New Uses and Old Fundamentals. And it was an article by uh, uh, Jeffrey Siegel and Bruce Manclark. Um, and um, so, so they, they did a lot of, uh, um, a lot of pressure pan readings in, in duct um, incentive programs by some utilities on the, on the West Coast. And, um, you know, generally if readings are less than one, um, those are, are good, uh, those branches are tight. And if they're, they're greater than two, they need to be sealed. So just generally speaking, you, you can interpret numbers that way. Um, this works well with some duct systems, um, but, but can lead to, to serious errors if you're not looking at, at uh, for example, pressures in the attic and how well connected uh, ducts are to the interior. So um, just like, like when you're doing advanced zone pressure diagnostics, um, the pressure pan reading in this case is a, is a ratio of the effective leakage to the indoors versus the effective leakage to the outdoors. Um, so that's a ratio. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that's, it's kind of a hard concept to, to grasp, but we'll go over some examples that hopefully will make that, that concept clearer. Um, if you have a lot of, of holes to, to the indoors, it will lower your readings across the board um, through, throughout all of your ducts if you've got a lot of holes to the indoors. An example of that would be uh, panned uh, floor joists in a basement that are used for returns. Uh, another example would be um, stud cavities that are used for duct work would be another example of, of a lot of 
leaks to the interior. If your um, if your furnace is, is air handler is sitting on a on a platform that's framed um, that's framed out of wood and plywood or sheetrock, um, that that's going to be very leaky to the inside. Um, so that will dilute all of your readings and um, make it look like the ducts duct leaks to the outside are smaller than they really are so you'll get you'll get low readings on on your um, on your pressure pan and, and it won't adequately adequately um, give you an idea how leaky it is to the outside so it, so it could lead you into uh, determining that that these ducts are tight and this house doesn't need duct leakage where if you did a duct blaster test, uh, duct leakage to the outside test on it, um, you would find there could be extensive leaks to the outside and it would be worth going after them. So it could, it could mislead you in that way. If you have, uh, um, you know, if you have one large hole directly to the outdoors, it could raise, um, for example, a, a, a large hole in a duct in a garage with an overhead door open or, or something in some um, section of the attic that where you're seeing the full 50 pascals of pressure and and that uh, and you have a really large, you know, either a disconnect or a really leaky uh, connection between the trunk line and, and, um, and that duct run. Um, it could it could really be misleading where the overall uh, um, duct blaster test would show minimal savings potential um, but all of your duct uh, pressure pan readings are high all your pressure pan readings are up four or five pascals and this looks like a horrible system but you seal that one that one leak to the outside and all of the other numbers drop so there isn't as much potential so it um, it'll raise all the other leaks and make it look like your leaks to the outside are bigger than they really are. So these are some things that, um, that you want to look out for. And we'll have an example of, of some readings on that kind of a house. Um, another thing that, that uh, is a typical uh, flaw in, uh, in duct work in many homes is um, uh, an under cabinet toe space duct so so in this example you know the cabinet the cabinet is lifted up and they're showing that connection so we've got a we've got a, a, a hole cut in the floor and we've got a good a good uh, box here connected to the floor and a duct that's fully connected to a register <coughs> and believe me this is fairly rare um, you may never see one that's done this well um, typically, you won't have this metal box here. You'll just have an opening in the floor uh, leading into the duct, and you'll have this register uh, cut into the toe kick um, without any duct connected to it. So when you're taking a pressure pan reading on something like that, it, it's going to be more like having two, uh, you know, it's going to be much more connected to the inside than it is connected to, to the duct. So, um, so, you, so you're going to get false readings. You're, you're always going to get pretty low readings that aren't showing the true connection in, in a situation like that. And you won't be able to get a pressure pan on this. Um, you'll, have to, you'll have to tape it over and then stick a probe through it to even get a pressure reading. But you want to look in there with, with a flashlight and, and make sure that it is actually making the connection. Um, you know, and... and in order to really get a good connect, a good reading on that duct work, you'd have to remove that register and uh, put a piece of cardboard or something. You know, if you can get your hand in there and, and put a piece of cardboard over that opening and, and stick a probe through it, that'll give you a better reading. It won't be perfect, but it'll give you a better reading and something more, um, more telling than, than just taking a reading at a um, register that isn't connected to a duct. So again, um, like I mentioned before, one, one leak directly to the outside can make the whole system look bad. And this is an example of that where 
We've got um, one supply register where we're getting a reading of 30.6 and uh, it telegraphs through the other one. So, so all of our other readings are, are between four and uh, five. So, you know, it looks like, wow, we got a lot of potential leakage on this one. Um, but they made the repairs on that one duct and, uh, and all, of the, all of the pressures throughout the whole system drop. So that's, that's one thing to look for is it, is it just one really high number that, that's dominant and and if so um, seal that one and then and then take your measurements again before before going after um, other leaks um, how you set up the house matters in in how you, how your readings will be um, if you have a dirty or uh, restrictive filter it will decrease um, the leaks to the interior and raise your pressure pan number so uh, one way to think of this is is what if you you closed off the whole return side so you put a piece of cardboard and and sealed off that whole return side so you're just measuring the supply side now your your leaks to the inside are, are decreased um, by quite a bit um, and it'll increase all of your other readings because now the leaks to the outside look like they have much more of an effect because you have less leakage to the inside. Remember, your readings are a ratio of, of leaks to the outside compared to versus um, leaks to the inside. And, uh, and if you make the leaks to the inside much less, then, um, then, then you're your leaks to the outside are going to go up. So your pressure pan readings are going to go up. If, uh, if you leave a, you know, a really dirty filter or maybe you have a, a, a pleated filter um, that, that's designed to filter really, really tiny particles and there's a lot of pressure across it, it, uh, it changes your pressure pan readings by quite a bit. And balancing dampers would have that same effect. If you've got, um, you know, you got three, um, three trunk lines coming off a branch and maybe the, 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 they have a balancing damper in there where during the summer conditions, they, they close off one going to the, to the basement so it increases airflow to the upper parts of the house or maybe they're, they're trying to force more air to the top floor, so they're closing, uh, closing other dampers down on the, the major um, um, trunk lines. That, that again, reduces the um, duct leaks to the inside and raises your pressure pan numbers. So, um, so if you have uh, one person go in and, and they're doing the initial diagnostics and, and they find you have really high pressure pan numbers, then the crew comes out there to do the sealing and they set up and do, do uh, initial pressure pan readings again to see where they need to go. And, uh, and get, they can get much different numbers if they set it up a different way. And you certainly want, always want your numbers to be repeatable. You want to always be setting up the house and the ducts in the same manner. Um, so make sure and, and, um, and get these issues right or, or it's going to affect your readings. Um, um, so to get accurate data, you're going to need to remove the filter and open any dampers and certainly with a, a Sharpie or some kind of marker uh, tape, uh, mark where the dampers uh, were set so you can put them back in that same condition when you leave. So as you're starting to see, um, pressure pan readings can be more of an art than a science. and you can um, you can get you can get um, it. It really makes it difficult to make make meaningful comparisons to dissimilar homes. So if if you're doing pressure pan readings on a on a building, on a home where all of the the air handler and all of the ductwork is in an attic, and compare that to a and the next house you go to is is um, is a house that has a basement and pan joists and and, uh, and uh, multiple return registers that are going through ductwork with 
are going through uh, stud cavities. So, so they, uh, instead of using uh, ducts up into the cavities, they're, they're just using the, the stud cavity itself as duct work. Um, you really can't have a, a procedure that says if, if your readings are X, then you do Y because uh, um, your readings are skewed um, from one house to another. So it, um, that, that makes it more difficult. But bud houses with similar duct geometry and construction can be compared to each other. If you're in a climate where, where uh, all the supplies, all the trunk line and all the supplies are always in the attic, then, then you're gonna have a lot of similarities between one one building and another, and and you can compare one house to another if, because the the duct geometry and, and the construction um, are similar. So it it, it um, so you can compare like houses uh, to each other uh, effectively. Um, but but what it comes down to is is the best way to interpret the pressure pan is is understanding that building science and and measuring that pressure to the attic and and look at the the duct construction and is is there potentially a lot of duct leakage to the inside um, and then backing it up with duct blaster tests is is really is really the best way um, to understand what your pressure pan readings are telling you is if you can back it up with the duct blaster test and then um, you'll learn maybe in your your area um, there's three or four um, basic types of homes and basic types of duct construction and and if you learn to be able to interpret those pressure pan numbers and get a good sense of how leaky those ducts are and how effective sealing those ducts are gonna be, then, then you're gonna learn a lot more and, and, and um, over time, um, you'll, you'll get good at using that art, <laughs> that art of, of uh, interpreting the numbers and, and they'll, you'll learn from it and you'll be able to do a lot more effective, um, lots more effective work. And I'm sure if you if you do a lot of blower door testing, that kind of becomes the same way. If if um, if you've tested a bunch of ramblers built in the 50s, and you can a lot of times you can walk up to the house and guess within two or 300 CFM what that uh, what the blower door test is going to be if they haven't done extensive air sealing on it or something. But but um, interpreting these pressure pan numbers can be the same way. You can you can go to a house. You know the typical flaws in, in, those, in that ductwork and in that type of house. And uh, you can do the pressure pan numbers and, 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 and maybe guess pretty close um, what your results are going to be um, if, if those ducts haven't been, been sealed. Um, so. Um, so there have been um, programs that... that um, that are utility, utility funded or, or have some kind of funding where you get a, 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 a rebate um, or an incentive to, uh, to do duct sealing. And um, there, there are many programs around the country that has successfully used pressure pans to, to pre-screen houses uh, for, for the duct repair potential. And, and, and sometimes even use pressure pan readings in place of a of a um, of a duct blaster reading. If if all the houses are, are similar and, and you've done enough research, you, you've got the numbers to back it up. Um, you need to do the research first to see um, see how that there's a there is a direct correlation uh, between pressure pan numbers in, and um, duct leakage numbers in in your part of the country with with the type of homes you see. So um, if, if all the ducts are in the attic or all the ducts are in the crawl space or when you're testing mobile homes and, and you still have to measure the, uh, the pressure in the attic or the pressure in the crawl space or the pressure in the mobile home belly to be able to interpret these numbers. But, um, but there are certainly programs that, um, um, that have worked
but you do, as I mentioned, you do need a large enough database to be able to correlate the actual measured duct leakage numbers to the pressure pan numbers. So this is an example of, of one of those programs. It was, it was based on 350 homes in, in the southeast. And again, you're assuming that spaces containing the ducts are greater than 45 in order to be able to interpret these numbers. Um, so tight ducts are defined as um, all pressure pan readings being less than one and a half pascals and uh, um, less than three of them above one pascals. If that's the case, it's considered tight and, and there's not enough leakage to warrant repairing them. So um, no need to set up a, a duct blaster and take a test. You can, you can rule out that house um, based on that information. In, in leaky, where you would go ahead and start, uh, start doing the air sealing for sure, if you have three or more readings greater than two pascals, then, then it's leaky and um, repairs are suggested. But then there's that gray area if it's something in between where you would need to do a duct leakage test to determine whether uh, it would warrant repair. And certainly there's, there's um, other repairs that are needed for indoor air quality reasons that are very important. So it's more than just energy. And then there's some special considerations for if you've got duct works in a garage um, there may be indoor air quality issues from, from car exhaust, as we mentioned. Um, um, it, it <laughs> sometimes it's rare to see a, a, a garage that you can park a car in because it's so full of other stuff. But um, if they do uh, park a car in the garage or they're storing um, household chemicals out there or uh, gasoline and a lawnmower, um, pesticides, um, those kind of paints maybe varnishes, those kind of things, um, you can have some unique indoor air quality issues related to, uh, to garages. Um, you want to open that space containing the ducts as much as you can to the outside during the test. That's, that's kind of an overall guideline for either doing duct blaster tests or pressure pan tests. So you open that overhead door during the test. Um, temporarily seal registers in a garage. So um, again, this, that would be an intentional leak, that, that supply in the garage. It's an intentional leak, and you would want to uh, seal that over um, during your duct leakage test. But certainly, it's, it's best to permanently disconnect them. Um, you know, during, if you've got a supply in a garage, during the, um, when, whenever the air handler is running, you're going to have air uh, blowing into the garage from, from the ductwork. But whenever that air handler isn't running, you may be getting air uh, that's leaking into the house through that hole. You've got a hole, and if you've got a, a driving force, you, you're going to have airflow from the garage into the house. And, and oftentimes, you know, if you've got a two-story house, especially during the heating season, um, you're going to have high stack effect pressures and, and the garage is always on the lower part of the house, uh, uh, not the upper part. So you're going to have air being pulled from that garage into the house uh, through those supply registers whenever the uh, fan isn't running. So keep that in mind. Uh, so it is best to, if you get permission from the homeowner, uh, to permanently seal off that um, supply register in the garage. So now we've got time to, uh, to take some questions.